Welcome back to It's Still Good on Tuesday. We hope you're having a great day today, and we want to welcome you alongside us as we begin the broadcast today. We're going to be talking about false teaching in our podcast this morning, and uh, we're going to be dealing with uh, just some of the issues that come out of that. So as we begin, uh, we're going to be talking, first of all, about a really important subject, and that's the subject of duct tape. Um, mentioned a little bit about that in the sermon. And, uh, mm-hmm. and so I, let's just kind of let's kind of just share some ideas. Guys, you all are youth pastors. You are, <laughs> you've been doing, uh, you know, you, you've, you've, been, you've had to be creative along the way. Oh, yeah. well, what's, the, what's the most creative thing? What's the most unusual thing you've ever seen done with duct tape? Done or seen done? How about that? Done or seen done? So my favorite memory is when we had just flown back from Puerto Rico to Orlando and a certain rather tall gentleman who will remain nameless in our church, uh, uh-huh, so yeah, yeah, yes. drove into yes. the parking garage yes. with our van yes. and ripped the, the <laughs> rooftop back. And so we used a bunch of duct tape to hold it as it's flapping as it goes down the road. That was probably one of my favorite memories. <laughs> Came with built-in air conditioning. It was fantastic. <laughs> you know, I've seen I've seen students with duct all sorts of duct tape wallets. Um, mm. Show me pictures of duct tape dresses that they've yep. made. Yeah, suits, duct tape um, suits. For but prom, probably yeah. the, one of the most. I, I think I'm legally allowed to say. I mean, we had uh, one group of boys that decided to see if they could duct tape a younger member of the youth group up against the, yeah, up yeah. against the wall against the wall yeah and then she, she duct tape you know uh-huh. so the, it, it worked pretty well the chair right yeah, yeah. It, it, this was this this particular time i'm thinking about the, the student was a willing participant this was uh they they wanted to see well, if good. this well, could that's, work that's at least good yeah so <laughs> i've seen it where the student wasn't willing <laughs> so my my most unusual experience with duct tape uh, of course i, I grew up in kentucky Hometown Ashland, uh, the, the 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 news story that put us on the map um, was the story of a gentleman who taped up his head like all the way, all the way, oh. left a little hole for his eye, and tried to rob a liquor store. <laughs> He's known as the duct tape bandit. <laughs> Had he now, robbed? The, had he already now, been to the liquor store when he came no, up no, with no, this no, idea? No, he, <laughs> no. He, so he, he, this was his disguise. I guess he couldn't find a ski. It was July, and and so there was apparently there, there were no ski masks available in the store. So he found a roll of duct tape, and he taped up his head, left his just one eye so he could see through it, and, and went into the liquor store. And two things he didn't count on. Number one, he didn't count on the guy behind the counter having a baseball bat. And the other thing he didn't count on was in July. In Kentucky in the summer, it's very hot. And when you wrap yourself up with duct tape, you can't breathe through it. So he taped his nose up. He did mm. not cut himself a, a breathing. So mm. it was so when they when the police finally got of course he was on the ground, the guy, the liquor store owner had him pinned on the ground and the police came and when they you know they un they had to pull the tape off. Oh. I mean the, it was it was sad. But anyway, so there's a lot of creative things you can do with duct tape and, and uh, anyway, I just thought, not you know, be on the list, I know this this probably has no business on our podcast. But anyway, I just just duct tape for we at would, use uh, at home use only. At home use only. <laughs> do not try this at home. This yes. is not a good thing. All right. Okay, well, guys, we're going to be talking today about again uh, as I said a moment ago, false teachers, uh, false teaching, uh, and, and there's there's a whole lot of different angles we can we can go on this. But what I would like to do uh, again at, at the beginning, I wanted to talk about uh, we talk a little bit about leadership going in, and I'm you know one of the struggles with this kind of text, and, and I think you guys saw that one of the struggles is how do you preach this without sounding really strident and mm-hmm. really, you know, angry. I'm not angry. I, I'm not, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm not on a witch hunt. I'm not out for anybody. I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, I don't have anybody in mind. I mean, there's no, it's just, but again, th- this is such a central point. I think this gets kind of neglected in some of the treatments of Titus that I see, but I believe this is a centerpiece. Th- this, ex- this, is, this is why Titus was left in Crete 
to put, you know, to find leaders and to put elders and pastors and teachers in place so that they could begin to eliminate the false teaching that was happening. So I want to come back to that in a moment, but let's talk about for, for just a moment about authority uh, and or about uh, just leadership and the authority piece. The uh, you know I sent I sent the outline out yesterday and uh, I looked at it and I thought, man, that just really seems just it's heated it's just just you know you can't treat this without without sounding like man you're just what are you mad about mm-hmm. but uh so i sent out this outline and and uh i to uh, sent it to brian i actually sent it to somebody else first who doesn't go to our church and actually uh you know just was talking it was offline having a conversation mm-hmm. with him and accidentally sent him the outline and i thought boy i wonder what he thought <laughs> <laughs> uh, but because i put in there leadership is you know we, we talked about this leadership is influence yeah. first of all second of all uh, leadership is authority mm-hmm. um, but then again today i talk about leadership being uh, accountability and uh, and the responsibility that comes with being a leader there's actually a fourth piece to that, and and I, I don't have you know just really not going to have time in this series to get into that. But but the fourth piece there, if there's a I, I kind of you know I, I, I was thinking more about a three legged stool, but it's really a four legged table that that mm-hmm. is you know we, we we set the table for leadership on four legs, not three, and and the fourth leg is is authenticity and transparency. Mm-hmm. And I think that's become, in recent years, mm-hmm. that's become more of an issue in terms of church leadership and how that how that gets worked out. So g- give me some push pushback on this. What do you... What do you I think? don't really have much to push back on that. I mean, we've... I mean, how many of your childhood pastor heroes, like, you know, when we... I say childhood, but like when we were first starting out in ministry and there was a list of guys that we kind of looked up to as like, man, these are the authorities. How many of them are still doing it? Mm-hmm. How many of them have let you down in very recent years? I mean, so like there is an authenticity, but I think that goes hand in hand with accountability. You can't be accountable if there is no authenticity. If you don't let people see inside, then, mm-hmm. I mean, there's nothing for them to hold you yeah. accountable to. I mean, that's kind of, I don't know, what do you think? Well, I mean, I, I, again, this is just a delicate issue because I think, Again, the people listening to this, the people that were in the audience this, you know, this Sunday morning, you know, they want leaders that are these things. They want leaders that are dynamic and have influence and are men of God and, you know, take responsibility. Um, But then pastors are real people. Mm -hmm. And to be authentic means that you are vulnerable with authenticity because we're not perfect. And... And yet there are people, you know, especially in our culture today, that if you make one mistake, um, depending on the mistake and what you say and what you do, like they're ready to, you know, get the torches and the pitchforks. Yeah. And so it's just it's just a hard it's a hard line to say, OK, how authentic do I need to be about my struggles and my sins and, yeah. you know, things like that? I think what what you're talking about here with this leadership piece is is just not having a leader who is um, high and mighty, uh, yeah. a leader who's not willing to listen, um, things like that. Yeah, well, and, and, you know, you made you sparked my idea when you made that comment that, you know, authenticity is now different than what it was, you know, 20 years ago. Authenticity 20 years ago was... You were the same at home as you were at the church or in public. Mm-hmm. Now it's you're the same on your Instagram account mm-hmm. as you are in public. You know, it's not edited or staged or anything like that. You know, I, uh, I of course, I, I saw this evolving in, in our culture beginning back in the 60s and 70s. I, you know, grew up through the Watergate stuff and, and all this and started... When we started seeing leaders topple, we started seeing people that were well respected in our society begin to fall morally and begin to fall ethically and begin to just, you know. So I think out of that and, and what I've always grown up with in church, you know, as a pastor is that, you know, kids are the worst. Kids kids will see through you and they will call you out for being a phony in a heartbeat. And and they will. And I think what kids will do, they don't just see it, they the, the kids will actually say something about mm-hmm. it. You know, they'll call you. They'll, they'll they will call you out. Now, here's the thing: 
the, that's what I grew up with hearing. I'm going, okay, so as, as a young pastor, I'm hearing, well, the kids are the ones, so they, you know, they want you to hang out with them so they can see who you are as a real person, that kind of thing, which I, you know, try to do. But here's the, here's the deal. Now, those kids are, are the adults. So I think there's a greater demand, not just from youth, I think across the board, I think people want to see, is, is the guy in front of them a real person? Mm. And I don't think that means you have to tell a bunch of cheesy stories about your family life and, you know, rat your kids out on stuff. You know, I don't think you need to do that necessarily, but I believe that there is a need. And, and this is, you know, the servant leadership model, uh, which, which is, you know, it, it is influence. It is, it is about, you know, how do you properly use authority? It's not just having authority, but, you know, using it well. Um, it, it is about accountability and being accountable to God and to people and to yourself in that. But it's, but it's also th- this transparency piece is huge because I think people are so used to seeing the leaders out there. And, and, and I think even more, I don't, I don't know that social media makes us more real, mm. but it makes us more available to, you know, to, yeah. Uh, yeah. for people to, to judge and, and to and to do more than just see us in our job. They're, they see us in, okay, well, this is what this person thinks about politics and on and on and on. So, so. so would you say transparency, more than just knowing every detail, all the, you know, the inner workings and the secrets, it's just being the same person in real yeah, life. Which that is you, also integrity. I mean, yeah. that's, that's mm-hmm. what integrity is the same, in, you know, being the same inside and out. You know, an airplane with integrity will fly because, you know, the, this part fits with this part and this part fits with this part. That's the integrity of the plane is what makes it fly. And and that's, you know, the integrity of leadership is these when these pieces fit together, it works. You know, you you, you fly. You know, the, the leader can fly at that point. But, but anyway, I, you know, like I said, this is kind of a, as I said in the message, it, it, this is kind of a... Uh, a mini seminar on leadership. You know, it, 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 there's there's a mm-hmm. lot of leadership pieces that kind of, to me, that just kind of bleed through the lines here. I just look at those and go, oh man, that, that's a, you know, th- these are leadership. And that's maybe because I'm reading a little bit into that as a leader. I'm looking at it from a leadership view and, and it's a little bit of a, you know, but to me, I'm just going, there's some really rich stuff in here that, that probably still needs to be mined out. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's, uh, we could... Well, I mean, and that's kind of the outline of what, you know, Paul did with Titus. You know, that the first is a greeting. Then he goes, all right, you're just supposed to go and implement elders, uh, overseers. Here's their basic qualifications. One of those things is teaching, and that's kind of the section that you dealt with this week is, all right, what are you teaching? It has to be, it has to be, you know, authentic, we'll say, to the Bible. Like, yes, yes. you know, that's exactly. where it, it can't just be whatever you feel like or whatever yeah. is culturally okay. You know, and so, you know, and then, and then I see, you know, him following similar patterns throughout the rest of it. But, yeah, like, I, I think, I really do think that pastors in, in general struggle with an authenticity issue um, because, one, there is this, there's this fear of, okay, so they get in, they, <laughs> they see me with my children, you know, that's that hospital yes. hospitality yeah. piece. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'll let you into my home, and yeah. you will see how dusty it is and, and how my children really behave, mm-hmm. um, you know, on a, on a Thursday afternoon or something like that, <laughs> you know. And that's, and that's, a, that's a scary piece for, for many pastors, if not all pastors. Well, and, and again, I think the fear is, you know, we're being judged when, when people oh, yeah. walk into our world. They're, they're looking and they're making, and, and people come in. You, don't, you know, if you go in to meet your neighbor, you don't walk into that neighbor's home with preconceptions about who they are and how they should be. You have no, you know, you just walk in and go, oh, okay, well, so they're this. And that's, you know, but when you're going to your pastor's house, Mm -hmm. you know, you have preconceptions. You have, you know, I've seen this person at church. I've heard them speak or teach. I've, you know, kind of got to know them that way in the hallway, whatever. So you have you, you have these pre you know these mm-hmm. pre baked in kind of ideas about this is what the person is supposed to be because this is what they said so therefore you know so then when they walk in and again they see your house is in, in, you know not <laughs> not in pristine shape or yeah. whatever you know then they 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 will be a little bit quicker to pass judgment because well I thought it was this in, in their mind this is the way they saw it to be you know again the the pressure that gets put on the pastor's family in my experience 
pressure that gets put on the pastor's family is not, you know, what the pastor's family actually is, but what people think they ought to be yeah. versus what they are. And then when you don't match that that picture to that point, they're going to go with their picture more than they're going to go with, oh, here's the real thing, you know, which is... So what I mean? So what do you think? I mean, obviously we're we're diving deeper into here, but but for the the church member, right? Mm-hmm. Not just mm-hmm. members mm-hmm. here at Fruit Cove, but any anywhere, you know, what what should their expectation be um, of their of their pastors of their leaders when it comes to this? Topic? Well, again, I, I think there are, as we said last week in the podcast, you know, in the, in the text, uh, there is a sense in which some of this is normal Christianity. I mean, this is just like, you know, what we see last week in the qualifications of an elder, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Th- that's just, man, that's baseline Christianity for most people. That's not that's not like this extraordinary superhero yeah. Christian person. You know, this is like every Christian should be this way. Now, there are ways, there are places, and again, as I, you know, push the, 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 the drinking, the alcohol part a little bit, I think there are some differences in some of those things that elevate a little bit more for the pastor as a leader. Mm -hmm. uh, Again, because you have a platform, because so many people are watching you, you know, that kind of thing is a, is a a real issue, I think, to make sure that we're, you know, that, that, that we're above reproach. You know, it's not just, it's not just, well, you, you know, it's not, well, they're okay, but you kind of have to go above and beyond and all of it, not just above reproach, but you have to be above and beyond in, in probably most of these just to stay even because people's expectations of you are so high. But um, let me let me skew us into in, move us into the, uh, the the text again today. This is a very strident mm-hmm. word from the Apostle Paul. You know, Titus Titus one ten through sixteen is a very very um, straightforward. You know. The, really, you know, when he, when he says, this is why I left you in Creed in verse 5, verse 10 picks up part of that answer, too. Mm-hmm. You know, this is why I left you in Creed. Number one, go find good leaders. Number two, because there are false teachers in this Yeah. Church. Okay. So there, there, there's, and, and, it, and, and again, I think this is every, you know, what Paul said uh, uh, in, in Acts, you know, when he talks, when he was leaving Ephesus and, and it says, he, you know, he told the elders at Ephesus, you know, when, as I'm leaving, when I leave, many ravenous wolves are going to come in. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, the same thing happened in Crete. You know, Paul may have helped establish these churches, some of them, but when he left, the wolves started coming in. So, so here's what I've seen. I, I think that one of the evidences that the gospel is being preached and lives are being changed is the presence of people trying to come in and teach false teaching, which sounds weird, mm-hmm. but I think that's almost a given that if if there is truth being taught, if there are if there's a if there's a you know if the word of God is being held forth and people are being transformed by that, I think the enemy is always trying to insert himself into their situation mm-hmm. into that church. Well, I mean, like you know, putting this in context, he, he's. You know, based on what you're saying, this was whenever there was an authority leadership vacuum yes, yes. in the church, and that's whenever well, and that's that happens. Yeah, so, yeah, so really, yeah. as a church, yeah. you're saying we should be preparing ourselves spiritually. Well, I think, I, and I think that's again, I think you always have to stay on guard for it. But, I, and again, not in a man. I don't want to. You know, I'm not trying to to you know light the torches and, and start a <laughs> witch hunt here. You know, I'm not trying to do that. You know, I'm just trying to say, just just don't be surprised when it happens. Yeah. Because I think it's going, it's just a normal thing. I think when, when, when you have a church that never has a problem with false teachers, mm-hmm. it could be because the pulpit is not really teaching the gospel. We're not mm-hmm. really preaching the gospel. And because the enemy's not trying to tear down what's happening, so that must mean I'm, he's either going to be against you or for you. You know, so he's going to either go, okay, I'm pretty good with that happening. You know, so he'll leave that alone. But if the if the gospel is being preached, people are going to try to move into that situation. There's a, you know, and again, you know, Satan is, is, if anything, a great imitator. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, everything that God does, he tries to copy it mm-hmm. with his own version of it. Okay, and that includes teachers. You know, mm-hmm. okay, well, here's, here's the pastor, but I'm going to send my guy in 
to try to to try to lead people off in this direction. But but here's here's the thing. Here's another thing I want to talk. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say like how. So then how do we protect? You know, like I think anytime there's there's new leaders, there's a leader vacuum, there's a transition in leadership. Um, you know, there are some, you know, there are some things that are different from one leader to another. Yes, course, right. And course, so, so this is obviously talking about n- not a difference of opinion on certain topics mm-hmm. or certain things, but this is, this is a, a false gospel that has been. Well, you it's, know, it's that, you know, uh, John Stott's opinion was that, that, I mean, he was dealing really with two things here. Number one, Paul was dealing with a philosopher named Epimenides. Uh, Epimenides was the one who quoted Cretans are always liars and you know and, and beasts and lazy mm-hmm. gluttons and you know that's that was that was Epimenides uh, and and he was a Cretan philosopher who was very very revered by the people of Crete he was a spiritual mm. guy not a believer in Jesus uh, he was reported to have been able to do miracles and I mean so he was you know he was like this really really big time spiritual leader certainly not a guy teaching and preaching the gospel and 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 lifting up Jesus but basically he had a following Mm -hmm. and that and and his teachings had begun to make their way into the church you know the things that he said and 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 so so Stott believes that part of what Paul's militancy was about was you you know you got to shut that down Mm. that kind of stuff is not good and so he kind of puts Epimenides on or puts the people of Crete on on the horns of a dilemma by quoting Epimenides to them Mm. you know so you're either going to believe what your philosopher said about you yeah which is or or you're going to deny what your philosopher says and therefore make his case so it's it's kind of a you know, it's kind of an interesting thing, if that's the case. We don't know that for sure. The second thing, and, and this is a piece that, that I, you know, I, I didn't have enough time to really get into today. But the other piece of this, when, when he talks about uh, the, the piece about Jewish myths, mm-hmm. um, and he talks about the circumcision group, you know, these are not necessarily Judaizers. You know, there were, there were Judaizers that were proselytizing Mm-hmm. Jews. I mean, they were there. The Jews did evangelism as well as the church did. I mean, they were out. You know, the the Jews were the ones who would go. I you know, I ran into this in Macedonia a bunch of years ago, but uh, I was riding around with a missionary, and he was taking us into these villages and towns. And every one we went through, they had a mosque. And I said, "Man, are there are there really that many Muslims here?" He said, "No." He said, "They're not here yet." He said, "They come in and they build their mosque." in anticipation that they will be there. Mm-hmm. So there was a sense in which the Jews did the same thing. They they would come into they would they would move as far mm-hmm. you know around as they could. They would go they had missionaries. They would go into cities, they would build synagogues. Yeah. There weren't there wasn't a Jewish congregation there. Now now again Baptists don't always do this. You know, we don't go in and say, well, we want to reach this city, so let's go build a sanctuary and so when we get there they'll be have, they'll have a place to go. That's not our. That's not our approach. That's not our rationale. But it was theirs, and so that's why every player Paul went. Hey, there was a synagogue. <laughs> yeah. Even though, even though There's the gospel, the gospel yeah. is just getting to that city. The Jews have already been there. They've already set up camp, and they've already got a building built, and they've already got their, you know, they they've got their teachers established and everything else. So, so there were there were proselytizing Judaizers, but I think what Paul's talking about here with the circumcision party is not maybe not so much that as much as people from Jewish background, you know, mm-hmm. JBBs as the IMB will call you know, Jewish background believers that that, you know, had a deep bench and a deep understanding of of, of Jewish thought, mm-hmm. but who were not necessarily proselytizing. They were just they were just espousing what yeah. they had been taught. Now the problem is part of the mythology talks about he talks about the the, the you know the myths uh, that they're following Jewish myths. That's a really important piece that we roll past that. He's not, you know, the, the the issue here is, you know, one of the big pieces of Judaism that we don't always drill into is that they believed, that, you know, there were Jewish folks, there were Jewish branches that believed that Jesus was an angel. Yeah. He was, he was a, you know, he was a, 
a revelation from God. He was, a, he was one who came to reveal something about God, but he was just an angel. He was just another angel who came to live among us. And, and what they would do is they would come up to you, they would knock on your door, and they would say, Dan, you know, listen, we know you're following this man named Jesus, and, and we want you to know that we revere him too. He was a great angel of God. Well, if you're not careful, you're going, oh, they, well, they said Jesus, so they believe, mm-hmm. they believe the same thing I do. Okay, whoa, 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 do that. You know, here, so what was happening, it wasn't, it wasn't that, that they were saying, you need to deny Jesus and come back home mm-hmm. to be with us. Right. They were saying, you need to accept that Jesus is not this. For instance, today, people will say, hey, we're good with Jesus. Jesus is, as the Doobie Brothers said, you know, he's just all right with me. Yeah. Jesus is okay. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to push back and say Jesus is this terrible person. He wasn't. He was obviously a good man, great teacher, but he is not the only way to God. Are you okay with that? And some Christians would go, yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Now, here's, here's why I would say that. This week, Lifeway. Uh, research in conjunction with Ligonier Ministry released a survey. I don't know if y'all saw the articles in Christianity Today. I think, mm-hmm. uh, and the and the report was there are five very common heresies that Christians believe today. Okay, you want to you want to know what they are? I won't test you. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure you guys will pass the test. But but the first one is this. Uh, and they were asked the question, do you believe Jesus is the only way to God? Mm. Guess how many evangelical Christians, being people who believe God created the heavens and the earth, they believe in the Bible, they believe that you have to have an encounter and an experience with God to become a Christian, and they believe in the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, They're, and they believe that you need to tell people about Jesus. They're evangelical. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 56% said we believe Jesus is the only way to God. That's more than I thought just it would be. Half. Just over half. No. Just think about that. <laughs> just over half. But here are the people. Here are the evangelists. These are the, these are the stormtroopers. Mm-hmm. You know, these are the, these are the folks going out into <clears throat> the nations and sharing the gospel. I need to quit hitting that spring mm-hmm. now. But, <laughs> uh, but, you know, th- these are the guys that are the, you know, th- these are the ones that should know. But, but what's happening in our church in our churches where we're not teaching I mean that's man that's elementary Jesus well, is the only way to God and and we just don't want to say that today in, in a way though that's I would almost say encouraging because what was it two weeks ago we were looking at the Barnum mm, research yeah, oh, yeah, where yeah, only three yeah. out of ten evangelical pastors had a biblical worldview mm-hmm. so in this way it's almost like all right so at least they've got 26 percent more yeah about than yeah. what some of these lead yeah. pastors do Um but no, like, uh, you know, is Jesus among many gods in our culture right now? It's, yeah. you know, it, it's Jesus is an option. He's not mm-hmm. the only option. Mm-hmm. And that's because we just, you know, we've been so indoctrinated in our culture to say, to, or to not say that someone's wrong, right. you know. Right. And, and I think, and again, part of this is, this is a secretism of Christianity and political correctness. You know, we can't, you know, we have to be tolerant. We have mm-hmm. to, you know, we have to be tolerant of other religions. We have, uh, and again, we have we have Jewish neighbors, we have Islamic neighbors. We have. So, what are you saying about their religion? If you're saying you're the only way to God, you know, and and again, those are the those are the kind of things that people are wrestling with now. I don't think we're doing a great job of addressing yeah. those, but that's there. The second question, the second statement was, the second heresy was this statement. This was this was the statement they made. Do you agree? Jesus was created by God. Jesus was created by God. Seventy-three percent agreed with that statement. Hmm. Now, now we're getting into the nature of Jesus. We're, yeah. Now we're getting into the nature of the Son of God, not just the the idea of Christianity being the only way to God, or Jesus being the only way to God. But now, who He is, and, and, and almost three quarters of evangelical Christians believe He was created by God. So there's that. And then the, the third statement, Jesus is not God. Jesus is not God. 43% said they believe Jesus is not God. Almost half. 
43 percent that Jesus is not God. So do you think some of this is coming from from false teachers that are teaching well, some of these things? Well, or do you think it's just people? people are, I think people are cobbling it together some, yeah. in some ways in their mind. I mean, there's so many. Again, here's the problem with the Internet's a blessing and a curse. I mean, in, in some ways, there's so many resources and so many. I mean, I hear people quote so-and-so. Or sometimes people will text me and say, hey, I'm listening to this person. Do you think that's okay? Yeah. You know, and sometimes I go, no, you need to, you know, no, yeah. no, no. And sometimes, you know, sure, it's fine. You know, I mean, they're not all, everybody's not bad, but, but man, there's a lot of junk out there. There's well, a whole lot of junk. There, there is this, I don't want to say trend because it's been going wrong, around for a long time, but it's definitely very popular in our culture right now where they're like, well, I like this about this religion. I like this yes. about this yeah, religion well, or what just, this yeah. guy says. Okay. And this is what I yeah. want to do. Yeah. It's all yeah. about mm-hmm. me and my own perceptions. And so, like... You know, I could see where, you know, they want to say that, yes, I believe in Jesus, that, you know, he is my Savior and stuff like that. But it's that's kind of new agey to say that he is God um, because God is this, you know, spirit. He is untouchable. He's somewhat even unknowable. But we would argue that's the point of the incarnation mm-hmm. is that you can know God through Christ. And that's really the only way you can know God is through Christ. And so, I don't know, so are you saying that, like, I almost want to push back. Is that really more the pastor's fault for not, well, not teaching I mean, doctrine it's, it's well? Certainly, I mean, certainly the church's fault for not, I mean, not teaching correctly. And, and again, th- this is Trinitarian stuff. It's very, it's very hard to, I mean, you know, it's easy to misspeak. It's easy to, you know. So, you know, again, I'm just wondering, you know, sitting here saying, well, if Jesus is God... Then what happens to the Trinity? Mm. Well, again, we know that is the Trinity. Yes, mm. yes, Jesus is God, but you know, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. You know, you you've got. A, we don't teach. We don't teach theology. Well. No, we don't. Uh, uh, you know, I've I've I mentioned this a few weeks ago on uh, Wednesday night study. I said, you know, if we if we really if we were really serious about all this stuff, we ought to just say. You know, if you're going to be a Christian, you really need you need to read a systematic theology. You, you need to have, and, and you know, maybe have two or three, but just to say, look at that one. Look, you know, that's, I mean, that's hard. It's like it's it's like handing somebody a new car. Say, oh, here's this new car, and boy, you enjoy driving it. But mm-hmm. here's this 800-page owner's manual. You need to read every page of this mm-hmm. to understand this. But what you what you do need to do is what we don't have, I think, as Christians, is we don't have a framework. You know, a theology, a theological system, a systematic theology, gives us a framework. It's mm-hmm. the skeletal system. Mm-hmm. Here's what we do as Baptists. I know we do, and I'm sure other denominations as well. We preach great sermons. We preach meaty sermons. Mm-hmm. We preach sermons that will put muscles on you. But here's what we don't. We, and we throw it out. Here's your meat. Yeah. Where do you put it? You you have to have a skeleton to put the muscle on. You know, you have to have the, you mm-hmm. know, you have to have a framework to give shape to the meat. Why? So, so here's a, here's a, me- this message today is going to go over here. It's going to, this is, this is talking about Christology. This is talking about who Jesus is as a person. So this is where in your mind, park that, that, that goes here, you know, and, and over here, now we're going to, today we're going to talk about Newman talk. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. So here, this one goes over here in the Holy Spirit category. But people don't have categories. They don't have yeah. the framework. We don't teach that. We don't. We don't say that's important. So we just we're just throwing meat out. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's great. It's not that they're not nobody's starving, but they're also not growing in the way that they could if they had a framework to, to put this on. Now, that's my a theory. That's just a theory I have. But I think that may be one of the one of the so, things of the church that we. Just so this do. actually gets to one of my main questions from this passage for you know for for the congregations for the the audience. It's like okay, we know we need leaders. We need our leaders to be doctrinally sound. You know, we need them to be able to combat the false teachings. 
So what is our part of the responsibility? And obviously, when you're bringing in a new leader, then it's your responsibility to vet that leader and to make yeah. sure that leader. And that's one of the things we didn't get to much last week in last week's podcast yeah. was that qualification right. of being strong theologically, spiritually. Right. And that's but, what, but, yeah. Yeah. but then it gets to this idea that you need to allow the leaders and you know to, to lead in this area and preach on things that are doctrinally sound and theologically based. And sometimes, just being real, um, people want to hear certain things. Sure. They want exactly. certain things yeah. preached from the pulpit. They want the Mother's Day sermon. Yes, they, they want yeah. the yeah. Christmas yeah. sermon. They yeah. want they want you to talk about, you know, social media. You're, you're getting and emails this week, for I, sure. Well, <laughs> I'm saying that that's you what... you got to drop that out when you're... <laughs> I'm not... I'm not. <laughs> but, but I do... I do think this 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 maybe talks to the responsibility of the congregation to let the leader if you if this is the man of God that has been chosen and you believe that this person is theologically sound then then allow the Holy Spirit to lead that man to preach what is needed and any pastors that are listening need to be encouraged to not shrink away from some of these well, false and teachings the and, and combat this, them. The other piece of this and. As we, as we see in some instances our seminary schools getting weaker in these areas, those kind of things, uh, you know, we've we become more of a pragmatic. And Baptists are very pragmatic people. We're, we're very, let's, let's do, you know, this is how you do this. So what we want to do is we want to teach seminary students how to be leaders, how to, how to conduct a meeting, how to do, you know, those kind of things. And I got a whole lot of that in seminary. I, I did not get a whole lot of doctrinal Teaching and and here's and, and there's a framework here. I want you to see this. In, in verse nine, uh, he says he must hold he must hold firm this 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 leader this elder this pastor he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. Yeah. So that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and to rebuke those who contradicted it. And then that segues into boom verse ten. Now we're dealing with the false teachers, but this is my contention. Verse 1, I believe, is actually the last verse of chapter 1, verse 1 of chapter 2, where it says, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Mm. And then verse 2 actually picks mm. up a different subject. So so I, I'm not sure why the editors picked up, you know, started at, at, at that. But I'm sure they had a reason that is smarter than my reason for being against it. But I just think th- this is a perfect parentheses of the thought you know it begins with make sure you find men who are able to teach sound doctrine and then teach sound doctrine so there's this obvious to mm-hmm. me bookend of, of, of everything that's said in verses 10 through 16 so uh, so anyway but yeah I think the doctrinal piece um, is a is a downfall I think we just and again we just it's not that people can't we don't teach how how do how do think how do you think systematically how do you think systematically about doctrine because this is true then this is true and then this is true and and this is where we don't help people to kind of put you know we put them into their world and they're getting shot at by different questions mm-hmm. and different kind of folks uh, and and they're having to reach for whatever answers they can find and respond to. But again, when, you, when you're sitting here, uh, and let me finish a thought because I started this open this can of worms earlier. But there, you know, they said there's five heresies. Number one, 56% of Christians agree mm-hmm. that Jesus, or that, that Jesus is not the only way to God. Mm-hmm. Okay. They, they, they believe that he's not. Uh, number two, 40 some percent believe three percent believe that he's a created being he is not jesus has always existed he is he is the second person of the trinity he's the godhead he is god in flesh but he is he is not a created person it's not like god said okay i'm going to have a son and here we go you know i mean there, there's obviously there was a body prepared as, as the scriptures say there was a body prepared a physical body prepared for jesus to inhabit which he still inhabits today that mm-hmm. throws people too they don't understand that jesus the the jesus that we're going to see in eternity the jesus that we'll see when you get to heaven uh, you're not going to see god the father and god the holy spirit you're going to see god the son we're going to see the you know the, the flesh mm-hmm. that was created, the, the, the body that Mary gave birth to, 
the, you know, the body that was nailed to the cross, the body that came out of the tomb. That is the body that Jesus is inhabiting today yeah. and, and will inhabit throughout eternity. Now, we don't always lean into that teaching, but that's, that's part of it. So when you go to heaven, you're not going to see, you know, God the Father sitting on the throne like Gandalf, the, you know, the wizard, and, and, you know, his good-looking son on the ride, and then the smoke kind of floating around the, the, the bottom of the throne. That's, that's what some people actually believe. That's, that's what, no, that's what it'll look like. No. No. You'll see one person. You're going to see Jesus Christ, but not created. Third, uh, Jesus is, uh, you know, is, is not God. And there are people who just said, no, I don't believe he's God. If you believe he's created, how can you can't believe he's God? You know, so and so there's about the same amount of people that believe that the Holy Spirit's not a personal being. We talked about that last mm-hmm. week. And then uh, here's the fifth one: humans are not sinful by nature. Yeah. Obviously, people who have never had children. But, <laughs> but you know, you you humans are not sinful by nature. Yeah. And people, and, and it was amazing, you know, that I think it's 57 percent of the people said. I mean, that's that's so, humanism. That's yeah. Yeah. that's what our culture says, you know. With every people single little good. children's they, movie, the it's there's people, people are, are naturally good, but yeah. they get corrupted Here's what or they get hurt. People are good by nature. Yeah. Right. So then, and, what they're saying is that the evil in the world is is because of outward influence. Few, well, and a few a few bad people. There's, yeah. you know, a few bad apples, but, it, yeah. you know, it's, it's but, really, most of us are pretty yeah. good people. And they make the yeah. argument, you know, they always tell the story about, you know, Hitler was yeah. cast out of that mm-hmm. art school when he was a boy. Had he been allowed in, like, everything would have changed. Like, we don't know that. Like, yeah. you know, and, and I would say, you know, to them, like, yes, people were originally created good. That was God's design. Mm-hmm. But even then, we screwed it up. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, and yeah. we were originally good, yet we still chose our sin. Yeah. So, I, I don't know. Like... I get I get frustrated. Trivial, trivial, uh, trivial pursuit here. Yeah, I mean, uh, do you know what the word Adolf means? No. Wolf. Wolf. Oh. I don't know. I don't know. Just, that, oh, I thought just, there was I something else coming. Mm-hmm. I thought there was about to be yeah, a yeah, nice a principle. Used well. to tell me I'm a wellspring of useless information. <laughs> but, well, <laughs> you know. I mean, basically, what we are talking about here, right, are wolves in sheep's clothing, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and this is what we're talking about. Yeah. And, and again, this is Paul's statement ravenous wolves well this is he's telling you okay here's what a wolf looks like a wolf is and there's three pieces a wolf is is deceptive mm-hmm. and a wolf is divisive mm-hmm. right, and, and a wolf is defiled so you've got you know a person who is a deceiver a person who is seeking to create division and a person will create division to build, not not just for the fun of tearing something down, but in an effort to build their own their own brand, their own group, their own you know following. They will they will tear up even Paul said even whole families, yeah. households. You know, so they'll come in, they'll they'll tear a family apart because well they're te- and I've it's so strange because I've seen that I've seen families I've seen, I have a couples I've had couples come in who just they have. The, 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 and and I saw a lot during the election cycle. You know, a lot of you know couples that a lot of families that were just about blown apart by the division of politics. You know, mm-hmm. but but it happens in church. It happens in in doctrinal issues and, and belief systems. And some one person supports the pastor and the other person doesn't. And and so the the families divided over that. And you know, so so this kind of the, the, the division piece is huge. And and. The, that's one of the dangerous things is that Paul was seeing, hey, we've got these churches going, but there are those who are seeking to cut them apart and divide them. Mm-hmm. So the false teachers were deceptive. They were lying. Uh, they were divisive, and they were finally defiled. Now, the aggressive word in this whole text is the word rebuke. The word rebuke, rebuke them sharply. It is a very, very... Mm-hmm. Uh, almost violent term, you know, to cut them off, literally is what this is saying. The, the word rebuke is a word that means to cut. So, you know, cut them sharply, you know, cut, mm-hmm. cut, and cut them to, you know, when you're dealing with this, cut, don't, don't do a super, don't, don't treat this superficially, you know, don't, mm-hmm. don't wrap duct tape around this, don't, don't treat this superficially, cut this deep and get this person away from, you know, get this person out of the, the, 
the influence of these other people, you know. So, so there's, you know, there, that's going on in there. And and here's the thing, guys. Here's what I want. Here's what I want us to see too. This is not. Th this is to me, uh, as a shepherd, I would much rather feed the sheep and watch the sheep and love the sheep and mm -hmm. pick off the ticks and do whatever you got to do. You know, take care of the sheep. I love that. Yeah. I don't love having to be the one who has to run the wolf off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that to me is not fun. That, that is a hard thing. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times, and, and here's the thing too, and I don't want you to just hear this text as a uh, kind of a uh, strident, no matter, you know, you, there's a very redemptive aspect to this. You know, Paul is talking about, you know, their, their minds and their consciences are defiled uh, but, you know, they, they uh, profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They're detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. But, you know, there, there is still a sense in this in which Paul is, is trying to be redemptive and trying to say, you know, we don't, you don't have to just destroy the person. Yeah. You know, you, you, mm. need, you need, sometimes people, you know, I, here's what I know. And as I'm looking at this, at this statement, you know, this, this, this uh, survey, there are people who, te who who do false teaching. They don't know they're doing it. Mm -hmm. There are people who just who just are not trained. They don't know that what they're saying. I mean, it may they may have picked it, something up again on the internet or whatever. Or you know, they'll they'll when when you're when you're especially when you're in a leadership role, teaching role, you're yeah. kind of going, oh, what am I going what am I going to say? And then somebody says something, you go, oh, that sounds good. Well, you don't vet it and, and go, well, is that in agreement with what our church believes is that you know I mean I've had to deal with so many people who have taught things in their Sunday school classes about the Holy Spirit that are just untrue mm. you know and, and I've had to go yeah you know and you know thankfully I've only had you know a number of years ago you know I had to go and, and actually you know deal with a guy that was that was overtly and, and intentionally teaching false teaching I mean he was warned he was you know we would we pulled him out. We talked to him, and we finally just had. I just finally had to just go, man. I just I don't want you here. Yeah. And and, uh, and and that was, you know, that was really hard. That was a hard thing to do because I mean, I had, you know, the, the, he was he was not a bad person actually. You know, uh, he had kind of he had a background in a cult, you know, and and had come to Christ, but he was beginning to teach what that cult had taught. Mm. In the past, and and uh, you know, and was kind of bringing that to the table. So that was early 2000s, you know. But, mm. but you know, it's not like this happens all the time. But it, there are people that, and I don't know. I still don't know really and truly. I've second guessed myself on that some because I'm thinking he maybe did he not know really? I mean, I told him this is not right. You know, you know. But but mm. I, I'm still. I don't know. It, it was. You kind of you know beat yourself up when you have to do stuff like that. Just to, sorry to switch gears like so as I was getting into these topics my mind just kept going back to the pastors who take this a little too seriously yeah, um, yeah. you know the bloggers who oh yeah they oh, yeah. enjoy just oh, yeah. blasting yeah. some other pastor yeah. or for, over minutia mm -hmm. um, not not you know primary doctrines that actually can lead to heresy what would you say you know to the church or you know if there's another pastor watching this you know about that topic specifically where it's like you know like the way i see it is paul said okay titus i'm sending you to crete to deal with the people in yeah. crete in the church at crete i'm not telling you to go mess with ephesus and yeah. and, and mess with yeah. that church over there so like i don't know is that well, I don't too know. You know, narrow I think, yeah, well i think the thing is in in the new testament there was not the opportunity you know, I mean, to go from Crete to Ephesus, you, yeah, know, took you had to get a boat, you had to take a trip, you know. Yeah. So it wasn't like these guys could push a couple of buttons and boom, you know, you landed a missile in, in Ephesus. They couldn't do that. So I think that it's, it doesn't get dealt with, but there is a sense in which, you know, an understanding that you have a range, you have a, a flock mm -hmm. uh, that you're dealing with that is, you know, you need to concern yourself with. I think the idea of pastors who are speaking into church situations across America, that kind of, I'm going, that's a new thing. That's a different kind of thing. 
personally, I have, a, again, I, I have a problem with rebuking people. If I'm not looking you in the eye, it's going to be hard for me to rebuke you. I don't want, you know, I don't know if I have a right to do that. Hmm. Um, and, and again, what I see, and I'm going to go back to the, to the text that Paul used, you know, where he said uh, that this testimony is true, verse 13, therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. You know, they, you know, cut them. I mean, you got to, boy, you got to, you got to be, a, you know, make a point, you know, make a, make a mark, leave a mark, you know, so that, but not, not to get rid of, so that they may be sound in the faith. You know, yeah. here's the thing. Some false teachers are very, te- you know, like Apollos. Apollos was was not teaching correctly, but he was a good teacher. Yeah. You know, he was a, he was a talented guy, and, and and boy, Paul saw that and said, "Man, you know, hang out with Priscilla and Aquila, let them bring you up, let them train you, let them teach you more perfectly the way." But yeah. Then go, man, turn this guy loose. He's a he's a cannon. He's really you know the problem is right now he's a loose cannon. But if you'll you know if you'll point him in the right direction and help him know what he needs to say, he would be powerful. And, you know, so some people, you know, you don't want to, it's, it's not Paul saying, get rid of these guys. Right. He's saying, fix them. Yeah. You know, there. Uh, this goes back to straighten out what is, straighten out what is broken, what is crooked, you know. And, and, and so here's, here's a piece of that. But, but yeah, I, I don't know. You know, I think that what I see is just there's a lot of gracelessness in, you know, and, and I see Paul being gracious. Even in that statement, the most strident statement in the whole thing is, is an attack you know, Rebuke kind them. of thing, but it's also a so that we mm-hmm. can win them. Yeah, so they may do be that so we can bring them back. Do this so we can build their it's doctrine, always so we can yeah. build their their faith, and and so they'll be sound. So it wasn't like let's push these people out because they're not doing the right thing, yeah. but let's try to win them and help them with sound doctrine. Which which goes to I think when you deal with a lot of these types of issues, mm-hmm. you know, the question is what do you want to be the outcome? And then, then, so answering your question, like some of these people that are throwing these missiles and attacking yeah. these people, yeah. like what is your goal? Like what? Yeah. What uh, do you want? Well, they likes want on they Facebook. Want, they, want <laughs> likes, they want likes on their. On yeah, their, they want exactly. likes on Facebook. Yeah. But, you know, but our goal yeah, should be our goal should be conference. redemption and the gospel. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's what I'm saying. You can't redeem. I, I don't know if anybody gets redeemed online. You know, you. Do, I mean, it's it's not a redemptive place. Yeah. It's, it's a place that tends to skew toward antagonism yeah. and anger, and that's what gets you viewers that's what people would rather watch a fight uh you know than, than anything else and mm-hmm. they and they pay big money to watch fights and and so if you're doing it for free mm-hmm. you know they'll just watch you i mean they'll, they'll just you know if you want to just pound this guy in, into a pulp then okay we'll watch you do that and uh and then like it because you know it was mm-hmm. fun to do so you know that's you know i i just see a lot of you know just uh, i've seen just over this weekend i've seen some things happening and i'm just going man, really, is this necessary? You know, and, yeah. and so it's just, you know, it, it's just, it's, I think it gives the body of Christ a black eye. I think it yeah. gives, it, it gives the enemies of Christ an opportunity mm-hmm. to rejoice and to, and to dance on us over these things. And, 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 you know, we're just walking into it. And I just, you know, I just want to tell, there are just people I just want to take, can I, can I just give you a word of counsel? Shut up. Mm. You know, just shut up. <laughs> Silence. Yeah. You know, this is yeah. this is you know, muzzle your as, as Archie Bunker used to say, you muzzle yourself. You yeah. know, just stifle yourself. Mm-hmm. And and that's what that's what Paul was saying. You yeah, so stifle like, these people. You know, so what I'm hearing is two major takeaways is you have to you have to sharply rebuke for the sake yes. of for the sake of doctrine that we're protecting the doctrine. Some people don't want to do that. Because the other one is you also want to redeem them. You want to maintain the relationship that they can continue yeah. to grow. And some people, they get off balance, and they focus on one more than the other, and they don't do well hand-in-hand. Hand. Yeah. Is that a yeah. fair response? Yeah, I think so. And, and I think, uh, again, I, I, I just want to go back to saying I really think that, uh, again, as hard as it, this is a tough passage to deal with, and, and it's tough to make it speak to people today but I believe you'll never understand Titus until you really drill into what's happening in those verses of you know Paul is dealing with this is the key issue and if we don't deal with this issue none of the other stuff's going to matter at the end of the day so so I think this is a foundational thing that we would rather neglect we would rather not deal with but we have to deal with it mm-hmm. it's and it's a thing. reminder to us today that the, that needs to be something that we make a priority 
in our culture. Don't just be all things to all people, but really be strong in what you believe and why you believe it and be prepared to stand up to people who say that that, that's not right when it is, in fact, right. And that's, again, that's the role of a shepherd. That's an uncomfortable, that's the flip side and uncomfortable side of Mm -hmm. being a shepherd. But but, uh, that's why you have a a rod and a staff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you for being along today. Thank you for being part of our podcast brought to you by our friends at Parlor Coffee. They are a great coffee, great donuts. Go to see them. I'm sure, I'm sure they'll appreciate it. <laughs> anyway, thank you for being here. Have a great week.